I'm gonna nuke this. Good evening. My name is Seal Cogburn, and today I can truthfully say that I've learned how to be a grateful Al Anon. My home group now is Welcome Home Women's Book Study in Henderson, Nevada. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Henderson, it's just another suburb of Las Vegas, more of a family oriented area, but it's got the same summer heat. It's all the same. So I've been in Las Vegas for three years um, before, but before relocating in March of 2016. I spent almost 25 years here in Reno, so this is home for me. Thank you for allowing me the privilege of sharing my story tonight. Thanks to Kimberly and Tracy and Mary Ann and all of the committee members who talked me into being willing <laughs> to accept the invitation to speak. I'm sure you know I just didn't call them up and volunteer. <laughs> I myself am looking forward to just enjoying this weekend of hope and recovery and seeing all my friends. I finally got around to asking Kimberly about the theme for this year's Spring Festival. And I have to say that I just kind of all oh, text Kimberly, see what the theme is. And I literally laughed out loud when she texted back, trudging the road of happy destiny because there is absolutely nothing that could describe my al journey better than using the word trudge. <laughs> and just to make sure that I wasn't misunderstanding the definition of the word trudge, and because I'm a good al and couldn't help myself, I got out the dictionary, well, really, on my computer, but, and my goodness, each definition became more and more descriptive of my walk to happy destiny. It said, to walk or march steadily and usually laboriously. I was like, oh my God, that's a check. A long, tiring walk. <laughs> that's a big fat check. To proceed or act clumsily or ineffectively. I was like, oh, that's a check. And then it said, and here are some other words that might be helpful. Plod, stumble, limp, lurch, slog, Blunder, <laughs> falter, stagger. I was like, oh my goodness gracious. And then it said, oh, here are some antonyms, which were actually more comical because this is how I'd like to view my recovery. Breeze, <laughs> coast, glide, waltz, sail, zip. Yep, I'm pretty happy I stayed in al -Anon. But the truth is that for me, it's been a challenging journey. And although I never used the word trudge as a descriptor, it is exactly what I've done. Slow yet deliberate recovery, one day at a time. Thanks to the many al who paved the way for me, they always said, just tell your story of what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. My story is like so many other stories. And yet we all have differences that provide an eclectic mixture of personalities and family units. This is the part that's always been fascinating to me, how we can all be so alike and yet so different at the same time. When I arrived at the doors of Al-Anon, I was in a spiritual desert. And the concept of spirituality and talk about belief in a higher power almost kept me from coming back. Thank goodness I heard that part in the closing. Take what you like and leave the rest. And that kept me just curious enough to follow the directions that I heard. Try at least six meetings before you make a decision that al is not for you. As I share my story, I hope that I will be able to articulate the way consistent attendance at al meetings, commitment to being solution-oriented, and a willingness to trust the process has given me a different way of thinking and has helped me have a happy destiny even though most of my personal circumstances did not change the way it was. Well, truth is, I qualified for al on the day I was born. But it took me over 45 years to walk through the door and actually attend a meeting. And it wasn't because people hadn't suggested Al-Anon. 
more than once. In fact, my copy of the ODAT, everybody knows that's our little one day at a time, the little reader, the one that just had the 50th anniversary. My ODAT, the inside price is marked $3.50 because somebody gave it to me. So I'm kind of thinking that I probably got that book before I was even able to read, but I drug it around for years and years and years. I just never showed up at a meeting. If you've ever read any of the book titled From Survival to Recovery, you've read part of my story. Not that I wrote and had it published, but, but that's just how typical that story is for me. I remember when that book came out, and I remember starting, I was so excited to read it. And after reading about 20 pages, I just sat there with tears streaming down my face, wondering how in the world could somebody have been looking inside the windows of my childhood home. I grew up in an intact two-parent family with a younger sister and a dog. Gosh, we look so normal, but I can remember feelings from early childhood that nagged at me because I always felt that something wasn't quite right. My mother was a stay-at-home mom, and my dad worked as a traveling salesman. You know, weekdays were different than the weekends when my dad was home. I remember a lot of fun times, and I'm often still curious today about why I just always felt like such a fish out of water. As I got older, I became more aware of the dynamics in my home. And I remember being very annoyed with my mother for making my dad mad over and over again. She just seemed to provoke him. And I wanted to tell her just to leave him alone and we'd all be just fine. But she never seemed to do anything right. And I knew this because my dad was very vocal about her inability to do things the right way. And I always wondered, what exactly is the right way? And where do you learn how to do that? Then I remember noticing that we kept having dinner later and later at night. And dinner time became an unpleasant experience. Truth is, we were waiting for dad to finish cocktail hour. When my dad was at home, my sister, my mom, and I sat around the dinner table and laughed and talked about school and Girl Scouts, and we often had neighborhood friends over, played board games, rode bikes in the driveway, all that beaver cleaver stuff. But when my dad came home, there was that uneasy feeling all throughout the house. Today, I know that that's walking on eggshells, that feeling, but I just thought that somebody needed to stand up to my dad when he acted so unpleasant and so unreasonable. Of course, I became that self-appointed somebody. The only result of that decision was an increased dissension in the household, and the fighting became more regular and bordered on violence. I didn't know about phrases such as think, or easy does it, or how important is it. There was nothing spiritual going on in my home, but we were all going to church regularly. And I forgot to tell you that I grew up in the Deep South, so in case you don't know, that's where those states are still talking about the Civil War. And everybody's at church all the time, particularly on Wednesdays and Sundays. So that was the environment I was in. We lived in North Carolina until I was in the eighth grade. And then my dad took a job in Atlanta, Georgia. I was a teenager by then. And of course, I was extra irritable about leaving my friends starting a new school, so that didn't help promote any additional harmony in my home. By now, my dad's drinking had increased and was more regular, and I was angry. I was angry about moving. I was angry that I couldn't have friends come over. I was angry that the rules of my house were so strict. I was angry that the rules of my house were so unpredictable. I was angry that I had to go to church. It didn't matter. I was just angry. Speaking of church, that was an issue all by itself. I've always said I just didn't understand. You know, I went to church and they always sang that little song, Jesus loves the little children, all the little children, yellow, red, yellow, black, and white. But my dad hated people of color. In fact, he hated anybody that didn't think or didn't agree with him. And I just never could reconcile those thoughts so I chose to become completely dismissive about all religion. 
I didn't need all that talk about God. And my prayers for having a happy family were definitely not being heard. High school was difficult, but I could see that my college, that college was my ticket out of the house. I applied for schools in Ohio and California because I was busy looking for that geographic separation. But my parents refused to pay for any college unless it was a church school. Truthfully, they wanted me to go to an all-girls church school, but they finally realized that that was just really too boring. So I did the next most logical thing. I looked at their list of acceptable schools, and I picked the one that was furthest away from Atlanta. Well, that only got me to St. Petersburg, Florida, but at least I only had to go to home on Christmas break. When I came home the Christmas of my sophomore year, I announced at Christmas dinner, another appropriate communicative decision, that all of my stuff would be arriving in boxes shortly because I wasn't going back. I'd already applied to school for school at the University of Georgia. That's where all my friends were. That's where I was going. And if they weren't going to help me, I would just take out student loans. No worries. Because now things were going to get better. I was back with my friends from high school. My parents were paying most of the tuition bills. My good girlfriend was dating a guy that sold weed as his part-time job. <laughs> and I worked just enough to be able to buy as much Pabst Blue Ribbon beer as we could drink. That's all we needed. We had really strict college rules. We went to class all week, and we only partied on the weekends. Now, I have to say that I am not a member of AA, but it was not for lack of trying during those years and a few years later in life. I was just a really, really terrible drunk. Somehow, I always ended up sick or asleep. And I just kept trying that over and over and over again, and we know about that. That was insanity. I graduated from the University of Georgia with a double major business degree, but somehow, you know, that wasn't enough for my father. He was so mad when he found out that I had been living in an apartment and not in the dorm that he didn't even show up for graduation. And he certainly didn't give any congratulations. Those actions, for me, were just the icing on the cake for my self-esteem or lack thereof. I didn't feel any pride that I had accomplished something that clearly was an accomplishment. And I didn't feel worthy, even though I was one of only three other females that got a business degree at that particular graduation, because you know, that was a long time ago, back in the dark ages, not like today. My mother, supportive as always, was pretty irritated because I had graduated from college without three important factors. First, I did not have a husband, and she just could not understand that, because what would be the point of going if you didn't leave college without a husband? I had never joined a sorority while I was there, and who were you gonna run around with when you were an adult if you didn't have all these sorority sisters somewhere out there in the world? and I never learned how to play bridge. And what was I gonna do with my free time? And she was just kind of really focused on that and I was like, well, gosh, I don't know, it's a little late now because I've already graduated. So my girlfriend and I, we said, okay, we're just gonna go to California. You know, it's time to leave here. So we worked all summer, saved money, and we took off. Of course, we realized pretty quickly that we probably were going to get out of money, we'd be out of money before we got to the Golden State. So we stopped in Houston, Texas, and we got ourselves one of those no deposit, no lease apartments. Found jobs instantly because you could do that then. And we started the good life. My roommate fell in love with a guy in our apartment complex, got engaged, and was planning her wedding. I mean, all within about six months. Her boyfriend's friend from college showed up unexpectedly, and from that moment, my life took a really unplanned turn because he, he was charming, talented, happy, and he was always the life of the party. And he was so exciting and so different from anyone I'd ever dated before. He was the one for me. And although he and I were the same age, he had been married as a teen. 
and was in the middle of a divorce and had two small boys living back in his home state of Arkansas. Yep, that didn't matter. Less than a year later, we were married and I can only remember feeling a little surprised at my wedding that this was happening. I was like, whoa, what happened here? My mother was really upset because I had refused to have a traditional wedding. There was no long white dress, there was no church wedding, and she was horrified. You know, now I had the husband, but I didn't do the dress and you know, but you know, that was okay because I was marrying my soulmate. And I didn't need religion, I didn't need all that spiritual stuff, I didn't need any of those things getting in the way. Well, 45 days after we got married, my husband's ex-wife called him and told him that she didn't want to parent the children any longer. So he went to Arkansas to pick up the boys, but only came back with the oldest little boy who had just turned four. She had refused to give him the younger brother who was almost 22 months age difference. It was a really tumultuous time for us. Michael, the four-year-old, was devastated without his mother and his brother. I was completely overwhelmed and felt totally incompetent as a stepmom. My husband's plan to finish his college diploma stopped. He quit school, took a full-time job to support us. He was an outstanding salesman and his new job in the corporate world relocated us to Nashville, Tennessee. By the time we got there, he finally had talked his ex-wife into giving up custody of both boys. And so we felt like we were starting all over again. Becoming an instant mom was more than just a difficult challenge. And it was another task that my dad liked to point out that I was doing poorly. Six years and multiple corporate moves later landed us in Dallas, Texas. I thought, this is a great time for me to go back to grad school. So I was a month out from starting grad school at SMU when the miracle of fertility treatments worked and I became pregnant. So we decided, okay, that's what it's meant to be. We moved to a small town about 75 miles north of um, Dallas called Sherman, Texas. We bought a house and then we're just ecstatic that we were expanding our family. You know, every, everything was fine. The kids were doing good. My husband was traveling a lot, but the Dallas airport was only an hour away. And we were thrilled that he was making a high income and that I could just be a stay-at-home mom. That was such a privilege for me at the time. My excitement of being pregnant quickly diminished as I spent more time in bed than I did out. My two boys were extra rambunctious because I was in bed, not paying attention to them. And my corporate husband was never home. What I know now is that I was taking one day at a time, but it was out of sheer necessity and not because of the understanding of, of that slogan. Our son was born in early February of 1977, and our middle son was killed in a car pedestrian accident six weeks later. You know, that was 41 years ago, and it seems like yesterday when I talk about it but it was every parent's nightmare. And we lived in grief for a really long time, each of us trying to heal ourselves in very different ways. We did a lot of outside counseling, and I became even angrier with the God of my understanding, refusing any type of spiritual comfort. My husband turned his grief inside and began using alcohol as a coping mechanism to hide his pain. I didn't see it at the time, but this is the point when alcohol became that subtle yet persistent intruder into our lives. You know, I thought everybody drank. I drank, not very well, of course. My friends drank. And so at first, I understood he was drinking a little more than normal. He never got angry when he drank like my dad did, so I was never fearful. I just had this nagging feeling inside. He's drinking too much. Family drama increased, and it included our oldest son moving back to live with his birth mom at age 12, and my inability to have another child. But you know, life eventually goes back to our routine. And having friends over for drinks and dinner and cards games became our, own, our major source of fun. We were in a small town. 
And then there was the entertaining clients scenario because, you know, my husband worked in the corporate world. I became extremely good at giving cocktail parties, but since I'd finally figured out what happened to me, you know, the sleep or sick part, I just became the smiling hostess and people raved about our parties. The money was flowing. We bought lots of rental houses. I became a licensed real estate broker and started my own firm. My husband left the corporate world and joined me in the real estate company. He was building homes and handling the property side of the management, property management side of that. And we had quite a plan for how this was going to be our retirement fortune and we were only in our 30s. By the time we had accumulated close to 100, real, 100 rental houses, the Texas real estate market crashed. And the short version of the story is that we were left with nothing but our dreams in bankruptcy court. I was again taking one day at a time, but it was again out of sheer necessity and not because of understanding the depth of that slogan. Due to our financial situation, finding another career opportunity seemed the only logical solution. And then I had the opportunity to live in California, the place where I'd wanted to be when I landed in Houston the first time. And I definitely remember thinking how great this would be to get a new start in a new place without all those drinking buddies hanging around. I kept having this nagging feeling in the back of my brain that said, he shouldn't be drinking so much. And the ever popular, if he really loved me, he wouldn't drink so much. I didn't know anything about keeping the focus on me. After all, I wasn't the problem. And after we moved to California, he won't have all those friends to get him sidetracked so much. So we moved to the Bay Area and we're partners in a startup company of adult vocational schools. I worked in the business full time and there was lots of excitement as things expanded and grew. I now know that I was completely 100% enmeshed with my husband and that often our only son took a back seat to our relationship. In 1992, we moved the corporate offices of our business to Reno. And although I was worried about the gambling piece, what if, a favorite al expression, what if he drank and then added gambling to the mix? I was happy. This time, a change would be good. Now we could regroup as a family and he wouldn't have so many distractions and opportunities to drink because there's no opportunity to drink in Reno, right? <laughs> I, I can remember thinking that and looking back and going, that was just crazy. Anyway, we were barely unpacked at the office on about day two when my husband and his partner went on the search to find their new favorite bar. This time I was even angrier and I began to feel hopeless. What if and if only became my favorite word, ways to begin sentences. I knew there was only one answer and that was divorce, and that made me fearful for my son. For years, it had only been the three of us, and we all know those teen years are difficult under the best of circumstances. Somewhere along the line, the fun stopped with all the parties, and when it stopped for me, I wanted it to stop for both of us. After all, we were a team. My husband and his partner started leaving a little earlier than five o'clock in the afternoon, and you could always find them at their favorite bar. And if there's anybody from the long-term Reno here, their favorite bar was Columbo's down on the river. That's long gone, but at first I rationalized that as winding down from another hectic day. They always wanted me to go with them. And I would go for a while, and then I'd start nagging. It's time to leave. Our son's home. We need to cook dinner. We need to check his homework. And I just wanted out. I just wanted to go home. But alcoholism is sneaky. And it just keeps creeping up higher and higher around your lives. And you try to believe that this is normal. But I knew that it wasn't. I began having feelings of despair and hopelessness. I started having crazy thoughts. One of my favorites that I repeated in my head often was, 
I'm going to say that I'm just going to run down the street to Rayleigh's, that's a local grocery store here, to get bread, and I'll just disappear and never come back, and he'll be sorry. <laughs> I live two blocks from the Rayleigh's, right? I didn't execute that plan because I couldn't bear to leave my son. I was in fight or flight mode 24-7. I picked arguments, and he agreed with me. I was anxious. I was fearful. I told him repeatedly he was drinking too much. He would agree with me, and so I would assume that since he was agreeing with me, that meant he would stop. He didn't. I knew I had to get a divorce, and I couldn't bear the thought of doing that. I thought, I can't let alcohol win. That just seems even crazier. Truth is, I was just a hot mess, and I, was, and I finally started thinking about getting some help. I'd already been to outside therapy multiple times, hence the reason I knew about Al-Anon. And since Al-Anon had been recommended several times, I finally looked up the phone number, but I just couldn't make that call. And then something happened. You know, there's always a what happened. The incident that started my Al-Anon journey involved my, our business. Although my husband, my partner, and I all traveled at different times to check on our schools because they were all in California, we would often have a coin flip to see who would fly to one of the schools if there was an emergency personnel issue because that's a logical way to do things, right? So one afternoon, I lost the coin toss, and I flew to Oakland the next morning to fire our branch manager for mismanagement of funds. The next afternoon, as I was calmly explaining to him that he no longer had a job, things escalated, and I had to dial 911 for fear that he was going to physically attack me or destroy property. When he stopped raging for a few minutes, and realized that it actually called Oakland police. He stopped, he headed to the front door, turned around and screamed at the top of his lungs. I'm sure people down the block heard him. I don't want to work here anyway. Your husband is nothing but a drunk and you're just effing crazy. And he slammed the door and walked out and of course, employees, students, it was just horrifying. I cried on the plane all the way back to Reno because I knew that what he said was true. I didn't want to believe it, but it was. I needed help. I'd already gotten an al on schedule, so I decided to find the meeting when I got back to Reno. It was at the Old Sparks YMCA. Well, actually, by the time I found it, it was in a room in a trailer that was actually behind the YMCA and the meeting had already started. And there were about 12 people there and they were all really old, well, like way older than me now. That's what I saw, right? <laughs> 12, there were about 12 of them. They were old, but they were all sitting in little teeny tiny nursery school chairs in this little circle. Here I am, I marched in in my little corporate suit, my high heels, and I'm sure I looked like a mess because I'd been crying. They stopped the meeting to tell me that this meeting was a little different than their normal Al-Anon meetings because they voted for the past several weeks to have sex as the topic for tonight. <laughs> they told me I didn't have to stay if that made me uncomfortable. I wanted to scream, my brain was exploding. I wanted to scream, sex isn't the problem, it's his drinking. What is wrong with everybody here? But I was too embarrassed. I was too tired by the time I'd found that th trailer behind the Y. I was already seated in the little teeny tiny chair. And you know, I didn't even wanna go home either. I ha I, so I just stayed. I, went, I have no idea what they said, but I know that I felt different when I left. Today, I call that the spirituality of the program. 
It's that immediate and genuine feeling of camaraderie. And as the closing remarks say, you may not like all of us, but you'll love us in a very special way, the same way we already love you. It was that feeling that I got from every meeting I attended from that point forward that kept me coming back. I was so anti-religion when I got to Al-Anon that if somebody had told me that I had to believe in a God or a higher power, I would have walked out and never come back. The God in my understanding had abandoned me years ago. First as a little child who didn't understand discrimination against other human beings. And then the God who let my innocent child die. And certainly not the God who knew that my husband was drinking too much and didn't answer my prayers to make him stop. But the feeling and comfort of the group was the attraction. I cried and you let me. I didn't share and that was okay with you too. But I just kept showing up and I finally figured out that Al-Anon was for me, not for him. I needed to work on myself and quite frankly, that became a full-time job. I didn't want to think that I was part of the problem, but slowly I began to see my part. And the truth is that I took more baggage into that marriage than he did. I didn't have good coping skills when it came to interpersonal relationships and that becomes increasingly more difficult over time. With more problems, it just gets more difficult. I wish I'd executed better parenting skills. I know I tried to be a good mom, but I know I fell short on many occasions. But I began to laugh again, and I became willing to try some of the things I heard at meetings, and I began to feel better on a more consistent basis. I found those meetings that they had um, at the Triangle Club that were at noon when nobody knew you were coming. So after, after I got through that first initial meeting and I found out how to get into the Triangle Club, I forgot that part. Because if you've been in Al-Anon or AA here for a long time, the Triangle Club has a sign in a front door today. But when I started, they only had a set of stairs up the back in this back alley and you had to weave your way through these people who were smoking and laughing and joking and they weren't really concerned about where you were going and it, I just thought that was crazy. I was thought, oh my God. But I thought it was weird. But those noon meetings, I thought, oh, this is just perfect. I can show up at noon. Nobody will ever even know I've been there. I'll just go sit in the corner, see what they have to say. So yep, I'd walk in at noon almost every day and I'd start crying the minute some of they started the serenity prayer and that's all I did. I'd, get, I'd leave when it was over, go out to the car, put on fresh makeup, go back to work and I'd do it all over the next day. And I'm, I'm sure I did that for at least six months. I'm one of those people that have no idea when I came into Al-Anon because I was, in, I was so distraught and in such a state of distress that I didn't bother to write that down. I was just trying to get through one day at a time. What I did do is I compulsively bought every al book available and I read them as fast as I could because I needed him to get sober. And since I knew that I was good at book learning, I knew I could find the answer if I just read faster. The daily reader Courage to Change was my lifeline in the beginning. I wanted him to change. So I kept reading that book, right? <laughs> the courage to change, he needed to change. I'm just gonna keep reading that book. But I finally got the reality check that I was the one who needed to change. So I started making some lifestyle changes. I stopped going to bars and I just went home. You know, it was quieter there. My son was happy. I was less agitated. To this day, I avoid bars, and it even became a real joke at my house. But for me, I started practicing first things first, because those slogans were the things that I could remember from, from the little bit that I could comprehend about Al-Anon. I stopped focusing on him, and I went back to graduate school on a full-time basis and worked part-time in the family business. And all that, the, although that created dissension at home and work, it was the beginning of a rocky road of self-care for me. I trudged through those two years of grad school 
but at the same time I was practicing live and let live. Today I kind of think, I must have had a lot of extra time to go back to grad school <laughs> full time and work. I must have, you know, imagine what I was doing before that. Anyway, I started practicing some simple courtesies in my home, saying please and thank you to my spouse for tasks like taking out the trash, which we clearly know that's their job, right? <laughs> Loading the dishwasher, bringing in the mail. I had to really search for those. I was practicing let it begin with me, and I would never have thought of this by myself. But I came to festivals like this one, and, the, and I heard this at a spring festival, a lady talking about how small courtesies made a big difference in her home. I was pretty sure I couldn't get those words out of my mouth, but I practiced in the car. You know, it's like car crying. Car crying is great. You know, you can just cry. Nobody's there. They don't, they don't ask questions, but I'd practice in the car. Thank you for taking out the trash. I, I just thought, I can't really say that. And then one day, those words just came flying out of my mouth, and I remember him turning around and going, oh, you're welcome. Like, like that was, he was so proud of himself. He'd taken out the trash. I didn't die. I kept saying thank you. It kind of became a joke around the house, you know. I made a pledge to myself to attend meetings regularly and to use the al -Anon program not only with my spouse but with my friends and coworkers. I started practicing more about keeping an open mind. I can't stay relatively sane without attending al -Anon meetings. Intellectually, I understand the steps and the traditions and the concepts and the tools of the program. But when faced with the emotional part of life, that al -Anon program can occasionally still just go flying right out the door. The good news for me and for the people in my life is that even today when old ideas become that first thought, I'm very quick to get that second opinion in my head and substitute some al -Anon thoughts. I've been plagued with the guilt of having raised my grown son in an alcoholic home. It was absolutely the last thing I ever wanted to do as a mom. I didn't mean to. In fact, I was determined to do it differently than the way I was raised. The gentleness of the Al-Anon program has taught me that if I'd known better, I would have done better because clearly I would have at that time. It's allowed me to make amends and to demonstrate my ongoing willingness to accept my part in the family disease. Today I can act better. I can demonstrate what I've learned in Al-Anon and I can use the program in all my affairs. I can keep it simple. Today my life is totally different than the hot mess I shared with you earlier. My spouse of 44 years died in 2015 after a lengthy illness without ever finding sobriety. Thanks to Al-Anon, I was able to let him have the dignity to make his own medical choices and I was supportive to the best of my ability. I have very few regrets, but Al-Anon had let me grieve the loss of the dream before and during his illness. And my Al-Anon friends were there for me every step of the way as I trudged that lonely road. I retired from a job I loved that I still miss, by the way, and I moved to Las Vegas in 2016 in order to have the opportunity to be an active part of my adult son's life and my two grandsons. Today, my primary job is to be the best grandma I can be, to keep my mouth completely closed about how my son manages his business and his personal life. And I work daily to try to keep the focus on how I can be the best possible version of me. And that is indeed another full-time job. My home's calm today because I live by myself, but my family members provide plenty of drama. I've gotten lots of practice saying, I'm just the grandma, <laughs> or it's not my marriage, and 
I trust that you will make the best decision for you. Admittedly, my tongue has been pretty jagged and ragged from some of the bite marks that it gets during these conversations, but I haven't had to apologize yet for being nosy and everyone still speaking to me, including my soon-to-be ex-daughter-in-law. This is indeed a miracle. I have a lifetime commitment to Al-Anon. And this gave me an instant family of choice when I moved to Las Vegas. I've always considered consistent attendance at meetings as a service commitment. I'm active on the group level because I feel that's where I contribute best. Recently, two other al and I reopened the literature depot on the Henderson side of Las Vegas, and that's been a lot of fun. The literature has always been a focal point of recovery for me, so I enjoy helping groups maintain an adequate supply of conference-approved literature. Because, you know, I know there are other people out there that think if they just read faster, they're going to get better <laughs> faster. I don't think I'm the only one. I could be wrong. Right? Today I strive for balance and to appreciate the little things in life. I try to listen more and talk less. Newcomers are just absolutely amaze me. And I think my family members seem to like it better when I listen more and talk less. My higher power clearly has a sense of humor because who knew that I would need Al-Anon as much today, if not more, than when I only wanted to get somebody sober. I am forever grateful that I stayed in Al-Anon and learned some tools to help navigate these complicated family relationships with my son, my grandsons, and I call them my family by marriage relatives. Those are those random people, you know, your kid gets married and they just, these random people show up and all of a sudden you're related to them. <laughs> Over the years, I've carried around these little notebooks. I have dozens of them because I have this big Allen on box at home, you know, where I keep all this stuff. And if I die, somebody needs to come grab it at my house and <laughs> destroy it because it's got a lot of secrets in there, you know. And I would write down shares from other members in meetings. And while I can't take credit for anything other than just writing them down, I'd like to share many of my, or some of my favorite Al-Anon shares. I keep this list handy for me and I sometimes surprise myself when I think, I don't even remember hearing that, but I wrote it down, I must have. And that's another reason that I have to keep coming back. I hope that one or more of these will speak to you. And they're just, kind of one phrase thing so can I get back with you on that I learned that here I was always really oh yeah I'll do that you know or I'd say yes when I didn't when I meant no or I'd say no when I should have said yeah you know I was just a hot mess about that too and now I say things even when they call and ask me if I speak I go can I get back with you on that coming to a meeting is an admission that I can't do it myself Anger is a false sense of power. Sometimes no action is an action. Feelings aren't facts. Do the right action and the feelings will catch up. I am not the only one with a good idea. That one. I should have that in caps, right? Across my computer. Or this one. I'm glad there's no loudspeaker attached to my brain. <laughs> Listen to the message, not the messenger. I was in the fellowship, but not in the program. And I remember hearing somebody share about that at a, at a meeting about how they just came. And they came because it was fun and they liked people, but they didn't really contribute and they didn't they didn't try and work the steps and you know and and that just always stuck with me because I want to be in the program and not just in the fellowship acceptance is not approval oh, I needed that years ago I can't be grateful if I'm being hateful do you want my opinion or do you just want me to listen I can honestly say that when I've used that, no one's ever said that they want my opinion. <laughs> ever. Ever. 
even my grandchildren. <laughs> we can't cure ourselves. Spirituality is a free commodity. Stop letting other people rent space in your head. Al-Anon meetings are my classroom. I am the common denominator in all my problems. And it's recovery, not a cure. Do I want to be happy or do I want to be right? And then, of course, my personal favorite, you might be right. I just want to go on record of saying I tried that with my oldest 13-year-old grandson just two weeks ago. He was being argumentative. I know that's a shock at 13. And I said, oh, Cole, you might be right. And he goes, of course I'm right, Grandma Seal. I'm trying to tell you. Are you not listening to me? <laughs> That's all they hear. They're right, you know. Life is not a spectator sport. Pouting is not a very effective tool. And the one I have to remember all the time is where are my feet? Courage is fear that said its prayers. They drink too much. I think too much. Don't borrow trouble from tomorrow. No is a complete sentence. Al-Anon is my medicine for everything. If I do more, I get more. Is my toolbox empty or did I forget to open it? It's not an event, it's the process. Self-care is not selfish. Al-Anon is my spiritual home. And the last two are ones that I use all the time myself. This person said, I have a built-in forgetter, so I have to keep coming back. And that's me. I can forget. If I don't come to meetings, I just forget. And I don't have problems. I just have solutions I don't like. So thanks for allowing me to share some bits and pieces of my Al-Anon journey. At my age, even though I came into Al-Anon later in life, there's still a lot of story to pack in when you're as old as I am because, you know, it just all is a big thread through everything. Today I try to live life on life's terms, and I try to do that every day. I've trudged along that path one day at a time. And I'm grateful that I stayed long enough to understand that I had a choice about happiness. Thanks for allowing me to share.